working working on issues of nonviolence, particularly with uh, with neighborhood children. Um, he's the author of numerous books. Um, most recently, The Gift of Anger, which has been translated into, is it 56? 26 languages. Um, also, The Forgotten Woman, the story, or the biography of his grandmother, Mahandas um, Andi's wife, Ms. Ruba. Um, he, last fall, he appeared on this stage with Kate and Martha Hennessy, uh, talking about the legacy of our nonviolent grandparents. Um, Aaron has a fairly unique perspective on Gandhi. Um, as, as a teenager, uh, and by his own account, he was a bit unruly, and his, his parents sent him to grandpa to straighten him out. Um, it, the first time I ever heard him talk, um, I brought I brought my two young teenage sons, and Aaron Aaron told stories of being raised by Grandpa, and I just remember my sons walked out of the room, ashen faced, and said, "Don't ever do that to us, Dad. We like it when you get mad and yell." <laughs> So I, I'm sure he will be sharing a few stories uh, like that. He, he'll be talking about his experiences with his grandfather and his his approach to nonviolence. And we, you know, we have a couple hours here, so we'll be open to comments and questions. Since I, I, um, I, I don't know if you've ever often talked to a crowd that has had quite this experience with nonviolence, but I think it will be interesting for you. So I present Arun Gandhi. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you and to share some of my uh, lessons that I learned from my parents and grandparents. I'd like to thank Harry for inviting me uh, to this function. He's a very good friend of mine and often invites me to his class here. And, uh, you know, I look at it uh, as an opportunity to plant seeds, and that's why I call myself the Peace Farmer. My designation is the Peace Farmer. Because I go out and plant seeds in the minds of people and hope and pray that those seeds will germinate and we'll have a good crop of peacemakers. So I've come here in the same spirit to share with you uh, about nonviolence, um, especially especially because uh, I found that there is a very limited understanding of his uh, philosophy. Um, many people seem to think that just uh, mere fact that we don't use violence or we don't fight and, and kill each other, we are non-violent. But I learned from grandfather that all of us, each one of us, uh, are, is, is violent in uh, different ways that we don't even understand and know about. And this came about through a very simple, uh, simple act on my part, as a little boy of 12, when I was coming back from school one day and I had a little pencil in my hand, it was about three inches long and I thought to myself, I deserved a better pencil, this is too small for me to use. And without a second thought, I just threw the pencil away because I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for. But that evening when I met grandfather and asked him for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know where did I throw the pencil and why did I throw it and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. <laughs> And I said, you must be joking. I said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh yes, I do, here's a flashlight. 
And he sent me out with a flashlight to look for this pencil, and I think I spent about two hours searching for it. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources, and when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources, and that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world, and because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources, and they have to live in poverty, and that is violence against humanity. And that was the first time I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, we throw away and destroy so many you know, valuable things uh, every day because it's become so much a part of our nature. We take more food than we can eat and then we just throw away that food. Uh, I was appalled to read in the New York Times not long ago that in the United States alone, we throw away $160 billion worth of food every year. $160 billion worth of food goes into the garbage every year. And we just accept that as a way of life. And we don't take into consideration that there are millions of people in our own country here who go to bed hungry because they don't have money to, to eat. Now that is a form of violence too, but we have not learned to accept that as violence. To make me understand this lesson thoroughly, he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence, just as we do a family tree, with violence as the grandparent, and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and, and uh, examine everything that I had experienced during the day. Things that I may have experienced myself or things may, I may have done to other people or people may have done to me. All of that had to be analyzed and examined and put in their appropriate places on that tree. Now physical violence is something that we are aware of because we see it all the time and it hurts because that's the kind of violence where we use physical force against one another. It's all the fighting and beating and punching and rape and you know all of the things that we do to one another where we use physical force. That would be physical violence. But things that we where we don't use any physical force, and yet we hurt people, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously. Things like discrimination, oppression, suppression, wasting resources, over-consuming resources, ignoring poverty in our midst, in just turning away from people and looking down on people, and hundreds and hundreds of things that we do because it's just part of our upbringing, part of our nature. And that is passive violence. And the way I had to determine whether this is physical violence or passive violence was to ask myself the question, if somebody were to do this to me, would I be hurt by it or would I be helped by it? And if I came to the conclusion that it would hurt me, then that would be passive violence. And when I did this introspection, within a few months, I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. The physical violence didn't grow very much, but the passive violence grew endlessly. And that's when he explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. 
So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out the fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. If we don't change our habits and our attitudes and our behavior, we are never going to be able to change the world. But on the one hand, we are trying to work for peace and then on the other, we are stoking the embers of uh, violence by our acts there. So we have to make that transformation and, and introspection of ourselves and change our attitudes and behavior. I have been asked to speak on so many subjects this afternoon <laughs> and part of the philosophy it will take me more than two hours to co cover all of that but I intend to do my best to give you some understanding of what my grandfather uh, thought about uh, and worked for uh, he you know he, for him nonviolence was a way of life it was not a weapon a strategy of convenience it is a way of life. You've got to learn to think nonviolently, behave nonviolently, and live nonviolently. And only then it will make sense uh, to each one of us. As long as we consider nonviolence to be a weapon that we can use when convenient, it's not going to work properly. Then, so, in his philosophy of nonviolence, and he often said this. He said, we are not fighting an enemy, we are transforming a friend. That should be our mindset. Because we get into the habit of considering somebody uh, who is a, you know, opposed to us or, or different from us, that they are our enemies. Or even people we are, uh, in, you know, um, not in tune with, we consider them to be enemies. And the moment what we do out of pity and what we do out of, com uh, of compassion. And to put it very crudely, when we go out into the street and we see a hungry person and, uh, sitting at the corner, we are, we, we are motivated to, to dip our hands in the pocket and give the person a dollar or two dollars and say, you know, go ahead and get something to eat and, and we walk away from it. We don't know whether the person has used that money to buy food or is using it to buy drugs or what, you know, we don't care. We just think that we have done our good deed for the day and we feel happy about it. That is acting out of pity. But if you are acting out of compassion, then you would stop to find out why is this person incapable of taking care of himself or herself? And what can be done to make that person self-sufficient, to be able to stand on his or her own feet and, and uh, do things for themselves instead of depending on society? And that takes a lot more commitment. That means sitting and talking to them and trying to find out and listening to their uh, problems and trying to understand them. And that kind of commitment we don't have because we are so engrossed in our own uh, things and, and our own uh, work and abilities that we don't even want to sit and talk to them. What we ignore is that people who live in oppression, whatever kind of opp oppression, economic or political or cultural or, uh, you know, any kind of oppression, the first thing that they lose is their self-respect and self-confidence. And so they come, begin to believe what society tells them, that they are useless, they are incapable of doing anything for themselves, they have to depend on society and, and they begin to un believe in that kind of uh, uh, negative feelings and they live it that way. So they con continuously are dependent on society. So what we need to do out of compassion 
is to help them both economically stand on their own feet as well as help to rebuild their self-respect and self-confidence. And this we can do only by respecting them. I am, I am reminded when I was a little kid growing up in Phoenix Ashram in South Africa, I used to notice my mother bringing old clothes from her friends in the city. And she had a room that uh, she used as a store. She would hang up those clothes there and, and uh, put a price tag on them. And the price tag was ridiculous. It was uh, five cents for a shirt or uh, two cents for, uh, you know, a blouse or something, some ridiculous amount of money she would put there. And I remember asking her once, I said, why do you put this price tag? Why do you want five cents and two cents for a garment when you can just give it away free? And she said, no, there's a difference. So when you give away free things to people, you are oppressing them. You are making them feel that they are dependent on you for your chat. But when you put a price of, of uh, any kind of money on it, they feel that they have bought the thing. And so their self-respect and self-esteem grows them. And that was quite a revealing thing to me. Because I, for a long time, I, I was one of those chaps who would just give away things and, and feel that I had done my good deed for the day. But that is what he meant by trusteeship and constructive action, that we need to do things for people within our society so that we can help them stand on their own feet. Uh, I have been troubled by the fact that many churches run soup kitchens um, day after day for years they've been doing this. And that only makes people more dependent on that food instead of making themselves uh, sufficient and able to take care of themselves. So we need to be more constructive in what we do and how we do it. I take a group of uh, people every year on a Gandhi legacy tour to India. And, uh, the purpose of the tour, I've been taking them for 18 years now, the purpose of the tour is to show them what individual people can do. Yeah, when I started talking about nonviolence and, and teaching it through the institute, the one common question that I always had is, what can one person do? You know, we are alone, what can I do there? And so I take them to these projects to show them what one person has achieved. And there are about 12 projects that I've identified in India. And I'm sure these kinds of projects exist in every country. But I am familiar with them because I lived in India and worked with them uh, for many years. So I know about their work. And I show them uh, these programs. I'll share with you just a little bit about uh, a couple of them. One of them was started by Rajendra Singh, who's a medical doctor. And he graduated and took a job with the gov state government of Rajasthan. And within four years, he got fed up of that bureaucracy and he decided to uh, launch out on his own. So he found a little village in the uh, um, mountainous regions of uh, Rajasthan and he uh, built a little home for himself and started his uh, medical practice. And one day an old man from the neighboring village came to him and he said, we don't need your medicine and we don't need your education. What we need is water. This whole place is starved of water and it's rapidly becoming a desert. And he said, I am a medical student. I don't know how to get water. You know? And uh, so the old man said, come with me and I will show you. So he took the doctor out on a walking tour and he showed him 
how the rainwater, the little rainwater that fell, would flow down the mountains and disappear within a day because there was nothing to hold the water back. And he said, all that we need is a string of little um, dams across the uh, this river way and, and hold the water and, and then that water will seep down into the earth. <coughs> so the doctor said to him, he said, you know so much about it, so why don't you do it yourself? Why do you want me to do it? And the old man said, well, you know, when I speak to the village people about this, they dismiss me as an old crank. They, they said, you don't, you don't know what you're speaking about and nobody believed me. But if you go and tell them this, they will believe you and follow you. And then after a few days he died. So the doctor felt obliged to do something in his memory. So he uh, left his practice and went and studied a little bit about rainwater harvesting and came back and he started doing it on his own land in a small way. And when the village people saw that he was able to stop the water from flowing away and there was a little lakes were being formed there, they thought that this was very good and they said, well, can you help us also? And he began a whole revolution. In a matter of 30 years, he has reclaimed 1,500 square kilometers of land from becoming a desert into a verdant uh, agricultural land. And all these villagers who were basically just getting one, uh, one crop a year are now reaping about four to five crops a year because they have such an abundance of water. And this is one man's revolution that uh, took place. So there are similar things that we can do constructively in societies to help them. And that is what really would uh, make an effect on, on society. And uh, we would be able to reduce the conflicts in society. I have often been told that, non and that violence is human nature. That we are born that way and there's nothing we can do about it. And I don't agree with that. Because if violence was our human nature, we wouldn't need martial arts institutes and military academies to show us how to fight and kill. We ought to be born with those instincts and to do it. But the fact that we need the military academies and martial arts institutes for the purpose indicates that this is a learned experience. And so we have to remember that it's not natural, but it's learned, and anything that is learned can also be unlearned. What is natural for us is to get angry. What is not natural for us is to abuse the anger. We have never talked about anger. We don't teach anger. We ignore it. We think of it as a very evil thing, and we don't want to uh, speak about it or do anything about it and so we just leave that emotion to everybody to deal with in the best way they can. And the result is that we all end up abusing anger. We need to understand that anger is like electricity. It's just as powerful and just as useful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse it and cause death and destruction. Anger to, uh, to human beings is like the trip switch in the electrical circuit. When something goes wrong in the electrical circuit, the trip switch flips and it breaks the circuit and, and it, as it, it's an indication for us to take a look and see what 
uh, is wrong and put it right there. And so anger to human beings is the same thing. It's telling us there's something wrong and we need to stop and think about it and do something uh, to put that right. In that sense, anger is a gift. And that's why the title of my latest book is The Gift of Anger. Many people ask me, how, how can anger ever be a gift? And so this is the explanation I, I give them. Uh, as I said earlier, there are so many things I can talk about, but um, I would leave, I'd like to leave you some time to ask me questions. And uh, so I finally end up with one story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us when we were growing up. The story of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he went out and uh, invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain the meaning of peace. And everybody came and did their best, but nobody could satisfy the king. And so one day there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit and the king asked him the meaning of peace and he said the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you, you will have to go to him and ask him this question. And so the next day the king went to the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And the sage quietly went to the back of the house, came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace and he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace and found a little gold box and placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every morning he would get up and open the box to look for an answer and he couldn't find any answers. So a few days later when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. He said, you sent me to this sage and he gave me this grain of wheat and I don't know what the grain of wheat has to do with peace. And that's when the intellectual explained and said, this is very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, it will not do any good. It will rot and perish and that will be the end of the story. But if you had planted this grain of wheat in the soil outside and let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. If somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts for their own good, it will perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole uh, field of peacemakers. So I have come here today to give you that crate of wheat that I got from my grandfather and I hope that you won't let it rot and perish but let it interact with all the elements so that we can all become useful peacemakers. Thank you. <laughs>